Welcome to Communication 200. This is Jody German with Mass Communication and Society. Chapter 2, The Internet, Digital Media, and Media Convergence. So we talked last time about media convergence. We're going to focus on media convergence with smartphones right now. Uh, you can watch movies on your phone. You can read books on your laptops. And these are examples of media convergence. In fact, mobile phones are often referred to as the fourth screen, with film being the first, TV being the second, and computers being the third. The smartphone market is fiercely competitive, and it's hard to know exactly which products will last. But it's become increasingly the case that we use our phones less and less as actual telephones and more and more as multitasking devices, along with iPad and other touchscreens. Let's look now at the origins of the internet and its evolution. One of the really exciting things about the internet is that we're all witness to the birth of a new form of mass communication. Much like radio, the internet has military origins. It was started by the Defense Department's Advanced Research Project Agency, or ARPA, in order to allow academics and military people to communicate on a distributed network system. Ironically, the defense industry, one of the most hierarchical organizations in the world, created the internet, which is the least hierarchical, most decentralized, and most anarchic system ever. The internet is what we call a distributed network, as opposed to a centralized network with one nerve center or a decentralized network with several nerve centers. In the 1970s, the internet was still in its development stage, and it was used primarily by universities, government research labs, and corporations as a way to exchange email and post information on computer bulletin boards. The 1970s and 80s moved the net from the development stage into the entrepreneurial stage, where it became a marketable medium. The invention of microprocessors allowed us to create personal computers, which were smaller, cheaper, and more powerful than the massive computers that occupied entire floors in the 1960s. A second opportunity for marketing came in 1986 when the National Science Foundation developed NSFNet, which was designed to link university computers, but also encourage private investment in the net. By the mid-1980s, fiber optic cable became the norm. These are thin glass bundles of fiber capable of transmitting thousands of messages via laser light. ARPANET as a military venture officially ended in the late 1980s with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But by then, there was a growing community of hackers, commercial interests, computer programmers, and researchers who had tapped into the net. Prior to the 90s, most of the internet was made up of email and file transfers. Then came the creation of the World Wide Web, or Web 1.0, which was invented by Tim Berners-Lee at the CERN Particle Physics Lab in Switzerland. Initially, the web was a text data linking system that allowed computers to access information no matter where it was on the internet. HTML is a written code that allows computers to communicate through web pages and links, no matter what kind of operating system they're using, such as Windows or Mac. In 1993, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois created the first browsing system, Mosaic. As the internet became commercialized, companies were trying to capture business in four key areas, internet service, web browsing, email, and web directories or search engines. In the beginning, AOL was the most popular internet service provider, but by 2007, AT&T and Comcast had surpassed their number of customers. As the internet grew, ways to navigate it became more and more important. Yahoo was started as a hobby in 1994 by Stanford graduates, simply a catalog of websites. Google released their search engine in 1998, and it became a major success because it introduced a new algorithm that mathematically ranked a page's popularity based on how many other pages linked to it. It became such a hit that in 2006, the Oxford English Dictionary added Google as a verb. The second generation of the web, known as 2.0, is much more efficient with faster microprocessors, higher speed connections, more digital content, and content that's more user driven. The computer is really our first example of true media convergence. 
There's never been any invention that brought so many forms of mass communication together on one screen. There's a lot of intergenerational tension over cell phones, but really, when someone's on their phone, they could be doing anything from editing photos to doing high-end research. The next generation of web, known as 3.0, is talked about as a semantic web. Semantics means the study of meanings, and the semantic web is about creating more meaningful, organized connections. Here's an approximate timeline of the different generations of the web, starting with the PC era and ending with Web 4.0. Our textbook list, Freebase.com, is a good example of the semantic web. At Freebase, you might read an article about a film, then be connected to an article about the director, then see a list of all their films, etc. Issues of access are extremely important as we're moving into the future. Speed and availability are not created equal. It depends on where you live, whether you're in urban or rural areas, and in what country. There's a national broadband plan proposed in 2010. It calls for at least 100 million U.S. homes to have affordable access to download speeds of at least 100 megabytes per second in the next decade. Google vowed to outdo this national broadband plan in several communities by providing fiber optics. Google reported that hundreds of communities and hundreds of thousands of individuals expressed interest in this project. Video games origins can be traced back to amusement park games like pinball machines of the 1930s. By the late 1970s and early 80s, we had games like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, and Asteroids in arcades. Today, online gaming is a massive industry, especially MMPORGs, where players from all over the world can interact with, with one another as avatars, their on-screen version of their self. Consoles and handheld devices for gaming represent another aspect of media convergence. Games like Xbox 360, PS3 are also DVD players, video recorders. You can access Twitter, Facebook, blogs, video chats, and Netflix. While the stereotypical gamer is a 14-year-old boy, this isn't necessarily true. The average game player is 35 years old, has been playing for 12 years, and women constitute 40% of game players. Video game addiction has become very controversial. Stories like that of the South Korean couple whose three-month-old daughter died of malnutrition while they played games raise concerns about people's obsessive addictive behavior around video games. On the other hand, video games have many positive side effects, such as increased hand-eye coordination and educational possibilities. The future of gaming promises to be more and more portable and more immersive. There are systems such as Microsoft's Kinect system, which uses sensor camera to capture full body player motion. We're also likely to see video games moving past entertainment, used for training, social clauses, used in classes, and multimedia journalism that's more interactive. On page 59 and 60, you'll see an impressive list of all of the companies that Google owns, as well as a quick analysis of what this means. Every time we go online, our buying habits and preferences are being recorded. One common method is the use of cookies or information profiles that are automatically collected and transferred between computer servers whenever users access the web. In 1998, the Federal Trade Commission developed Fair Information Practice Principles, which you can find on page 60. The Patriot Act, which became a law just a few months after 9-11 and was renewed in 2006, grants the government sweeping powers to uh, observe our online communications, including email and browsing records. Identity theft is another controversial aspect of the Internet, which is defined as the illegal obtaining of personal credit and identity information in order to fraudulently spend other people's money. There's a lot of concern about this thing called the digital divide, which is basically the gap between people who have access to the Internet and those who don't. Age, 
education, and just simply having access to the internet are huge factors in this. And the United States, of course, has plenty of access to the internet, but not every country does. Most forms of mass communication claim that they're going to reach everyone. Radio certainly did, television, and now the internet. Despite the concerns over the digital divide, many people do praise the internet for its democratic possibilities. Some advocates even claim that the internet is the most democratic social network ever conceived. The big question for today's generations to ask is, will the internet's promising social possibilities be crowded out by its commercial concerns. Well, that's it for Chapter 2. Tune in next week when we talk about popular music.